Welcome. How much did we miss Will and Grace? It's the best, isn't it? My name is Stacy Wilson Hunt. I work for New York Magazine and Vulture here in LA, and I'm so honored to speak to Megan Mullally today. So let's bring her up to the stage. Welcome. It's a great crowd. It's a very good crowd. As much water as you want. Oh, so nice. you backstage, you said you hadn't seen this episode. How did it play for I you? I saw it on uh, somebody's phone oh, right before. Right. <laughs> that I had count. to do. That I had count. to go do press about it, and I hadn't seen it, so I watched it on um, somebody from uh, NBC Universal's phone. <laughs> so I liked it better not on a phone. I mean, I liked yeah. it on the phone, but this was good to see. Well, it being in a on. with a crowd too, I think, makes a big difference. Yeah, that was really nice. Really nice to see it with people's reactions. Yes. Um, so before we get to the show, I did have a couple just um, questions for my own curiosity about how you got started. Um, who or what inspired you to act initially? Well, my father was an actor, but he never uh, was particularly successful. He was an aspiring actor. He was a, when he wasn't busy um, getting wasted, he... <laughs> <laughs> he was a contract player at Paramount in the 50s, and then we moved back to Oklahoma where I, um, my parents had grown up, and then he did like dinner theater and things like that around, you know, the Texas, you know, like in Dallas and Fort Worth and things like that, and occasionally he would do a commercial or something of that nature. He was very theatrical in real life, though. <laughs> so he didn't even need to act. <laughs> no, it made up for any lack of getting actual jobs. He was <laughs> always performing. <laughs> so. and did, you, did you emulate sort of his theatrical nature? Were you a showy kid, or did you kind of wait a little bit to show those qualities? Yeah, no, I was extremely shy. I was an only child. I spent a lot of time in my room with the door closed, and I would put on a record and try to come up with a really dramatic song, uh, I mean, really dramatic <laughs> dance to a certain song, and then I'd have, I'd perfect it, and then have my mother come in and watch it. Um, and they were always, uh, in, usually involved, uh, toward the end there would be a mad scene, and then my character would die of love. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I was quite shy and inhibited, oh. and I never uh, studied acting. Actually, I was, I tried when my freshman year, beginning of my freshman year at Northwestern, mm -hmm. I tried and I was just completely mortified. I didn't know how to, you know, people were rolling around on the ground pretending to be whatever, and I just was like, <laughs> yeah, count me out. So, <laughs> uh, I think I mostly, um, I always was very drawn to performance, so I started singing First, you have a great voice. Have you guys heard her sing? Thank yeah, you. very not, talented. Not yeah. speaking voice. <laughs> speaking voice, not so much. They're both excellent. <laughs> um, I started singing when I was really little, and then um, I was in a ballet company uh, through high school, and then I did, you know, a lot of theater musicals, and I, I had like a couple of speaking parts and shows, you know, from the time I was twelve, but I never. Um, yeah, I think I learned by reading books, by reading novels, because I think I would, I would, I would get so involved in the book that I would just act it all out. I would kind of make the movie of it in my head. Hmm. And when did you become comfortable acting? Obviously, it happened um, at some point. Uh, <laughs> this may surprise you, but probably Will and Grace. <laughs> yeah, I really, I mean, I guess I was acting, you know, professionally since the time, from the time I was 20, and I got Will and Grace when I was 39, so, uh, but I, I was pretty comfortable, I mean, I won't say that, I guess, we did a couple musicals on Broadway before I got Will and Grace, I did Grease, a revival of Grease, and a revival of How to Succeed in Business. And um, I guess when you do like over 500 performances or something, you get pretty comfortable. But I don't think I, I didn't know myself as a comedic actress, I think. I, I always did 
things that were comedic in nature, but very um, low key, just like the friend, you know, but it was, I mean, I did a lot of, you know, guest stars on sitcoms and things like that, but I never thought I had any particular acuity for comedy until Will and Grace, and I thought, oh, well, I guess the people are buying it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> now, is it true that you auditioned to play Elaine on Seinfeld? I did, yeah. I was up for Elaine on Seinfeld. Wow. Uh, yeah. Fellow Northwesterner, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Mm -hmm. I went to college with Julia, um, yeah, but she was she was. It's a hard one, hard act yeah. to be. Yeah, <laughs> it's spoiler alert. I didn't get it. <laughs> in, case, in case I don't want to. And we're happy anyone's. for that because it freed you up to to play Karen on Will and Grace. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, what do you remember about uh, your audition for Will and Grace? Did you was you were you part of a huge group of people? D did they have you on their radar? Obviously, you had already read for Elaine. Were you in the NBC system at that point? Well, I also auditioned for Grace first. Okay. And they were like, mm, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, and then my agent called and said they want you to audition for Will, this pilot called Will and Grace. And I was like, dumbass, I auditioned for that like two weeks ago. She was like, no, dumbass. <laughs> number one, um, there's another part, and I didn't remember even re I didn't even remember there being another woman in the. Pilot. So they Probably sent me just the read script for again. Will and Grace or some conversation with the two of them. Yeah. yeah. And so I read it again and I thought, I don't know, because they had just done this show called Sybil with Sybil Shepherd and Christine Bransky played her rich, wisecracking boozy. friend. Yeah. Boozy. Yeah. Was she boozy? She was. Yeah. Okay, so boozy <laughs> friend. And I thought, yeah, I don't know if I can do much better than that or bring anything new to it. And then I thought, oh, maybe I can. <laughs> <laughs> I make her really weird, you know. And 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 on that on that note, what what do you remember about how Karen was initially described? Was it what we see now and what we saw throughout the series, or did she become more fleshed no, out? No, it was it was really different. It was it was quite um, it was quite a lot like that Christine Bransky part in Sybil. Like I don't think there was much difference. She came in with a whole bunch of shopping bags. And, you know, she had a ton of money and she lived on the east side and she was married to a rich guy. And um, it was, I think, like in the pilot or the first episode that I started calling everyone honey. And there was this thing where I used to go devil and they're bringing that back now, which you'll see in some of the episodes that we've shot recently. Those. And then my voice wasn't high because I thought, well, I will certainly be released from my contract um, <laughs> if I do that. But uh, I had done a lot of shows, uh, guested on or done shows that only lasted for 13 episodes where I played really crazy characters. And I thought, yeah, I don't think this is the right time. So the voice just gets higher and higher and higher and higher over the first Probably about ten episodes or so, <laughs> and then, Were you just then slowly just raising really it high. a little bit each episode. Yeah, yeah, I was just sneaking it in. Really, it was kind of unconscious, though. I think I don't think I did that consciously. I think it's just that the the pace of Well and Grace is very much. It's I would liken it more to like The Simpsons or Bob's Burgers or something than a. It's it's more farce than than it is, uh, you know, normal sitcom especially these days because like it's so unique now it's, so, it's yeah. so unique now yeah and the kind of physical comedy that you see on well and grace you don't see on any other live action shows i don't think and then once you achieve the, the proper decibel level for the voice was it hard to maintain <laughs> because that, that no, can't be easy it's very easy it's just you know Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> You're downplaying really your easy. genius. People here, are always <laughs> worried about you know my vocal cords, but it's not. It doesn't involve any like strenuous activity of the throat. Um, I save that for my home life. What? <laughs> what? Oh. I was gonna let you finish that because I knew it was. I knew that was percolating in there. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, so it got higher and higher, and then there it was. And um, I, I, I like, I like to, I like 
that Karen has, uh, I brought her, uh, I, th I think I'm, I brought her a, a childlike joy, you know, even though she's so horrible, she, she doesn't really know how horrible she is a lot of the time, and uh, it's, uh, I like that she can giggle and laugh and have fun at the drop of a hat like a kid, I think that's a nice attribute. <laughs> it's a great skill to have. Um, so the show premieres in 98. And at what point did you realize that you'd created something indelible, but also just like a giant hit? Because giant hits have never been easy to create. And, you know, the 90s was all about must-see TV, and there were, there were other shows like this, but still, the subject matter, these characters, groundbreaking in terms of gay characters, it's hard to even imagine now a world before this, because it's just now we take for granted these characters, but it wasn't like this. No, it was, I don't think there were any other gay characters on network television at the time. I think the last, uh, there, Billy Crystal uh, was a supporting character on Soap in the 70s, I think, or 80s. And then Ellen did her show, and Ellen kind of paved the way. The problem f with Ellen and her show's longevity was that she was really brave, and she came out on the show, but then the way that it was done... Um, you couldn't, you had to ad keep addressing it. You couldn't right. just, the next episode couldn't just be like, you know, hijinks in a bowling alley. It had to be <laughs> like, okay, so. Or see her dating and yes, laughing and having her, fun. And, yes, yeah. exactly. Right. So uh, the fact that the characters of Jack and Will are, are, you know, being gay is just one of their many attributes and just one of the many factors of, of their lives. Um, I think helped to depoliticize the issue. So it was mostly about four friends or four people who, um, you know, interact in a variety of ways. And and it was just we were free to sort of focus on the comedy more than um, the fact that those characters are gay. And the gay bashing is built in for you if you were so inclined. If you're from, you know, if you're a trucker from South Dakota. Are, they make fun of each other a lot. Yeah, yeah, like Will and Jack gay bash each other so much that like your work is already cut out for you. <laughs> and obviously you had the amazing Jim Burroughs kind of leading you through this process. Every episode. Um, and this, which is incredible, and he's still involved. What, what wisdom did he bring, um, you know, obviously from all of his years working on Taxi and, and so many shows I can't even remember now, but he brought, he brings such a great old school authenticity, yeah. but marries it with cutting edge humor, which I really truly can't think of another show that does that. It's hard to describe what Jimmy brings, how, how much he brings to the show. Um, obviously all of the physical comedy, uh, you know, like a lot of the, you know, if, if Sean and I have a slap fight or something, <laughs> Uh, there is a really good one coming up, by the way. <laughs> Finally! I was like, we got through 12 episodes without doing a big slap fight with me and Sean. But uh, there will be one coming. Um, all of the physical stuff, and then just really like little things like in that episode, you know when Eric uh, puts his arm around me and I make some crack and then I stop, I put my hand on his arm? Um, just how at the end I, I like patted his arm twice when I was done. That was Jimmy. He said, just give it a, just finish that it. That wasn't the script. That was him saying, we yeah. want her to acknowledge you're He's my friend. Just the little things. It's like the little details. And, and then, of course, the, the overview of everything. I mean, it, it's really hard to describe what he brings to the show uh, because it's, it's so far reaching and on so many levels. Mm. And we just love him so much. And he's such a, you know, the first, we shot the first scene of the first episode coming back um, just in August, this past August. And we looked over and Jimmy was crying. Oh. And Eric went up to him and he was like, hey, you know, Jim, are you all right? And he was like, yeah, I just haven't heard laughs like that for a really long time. Oh, wow. That's... Yeah, really amazing. It makes me want to cry, too. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all needed it, too. I think, I think it came back at, at right the perfect time where we were all just like, I need to Why? Lie. What's going on? <laughs> just some stuff. Sorry, I haven't looked at my phone lately. Is there something I should know? I don't know. Something's been I've brewing. I've been so happy. 
<laughs> well, we live in a bubble in Hollywood. Come on, you have to know that. Everything's perfect here. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> We're immune to the ills of the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, no, it's weird because when you when you think about it, and nobody could have ever known, aside, you know, what's going on in the country and the world aside, uh, just if you're talking about television, there really aren't that many comedy. There's so many great shows on television. Not laugh out loud shows. But there aren't yeah. really great just, you know, knock down, drag out comedies that are laugh out loud comedies. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the kids just say LOL there. now. <laughs> yeah, LOL. So obviously you had an incredible run, eight seasons. Um, what did it feel like to end the show in May of 2006? Were you, were you sad? Were you scared? Were you ready to move on? How did it feel, that final episode to wrap? We were, I, you know, I'd say more than anything, we were really sad. I mean, it was like, you know, a death or something. We were all hysterically crying. And um, I was lined up to do that talk show that I did briefly, which, thank God, that didn't go. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was but revisiting that today. I've being a talk show host. Can you imagine? <laughs> I remember you were good at it, but it seems like not a great I, use of all of your skills. It was definitely something that I felt like at the time I needed to try because I had been offered out of the blue, like two companies, Oprah's uh, King World, which did, the, which did Oprah's show, and then NBC Universal both offered me you know, offered me to, uh, you know, the hosting job, a daytime talk show, and I thought, well, I, somebody's trying to tell me something. I should at least give it a try. And I always loved talk shows. Um, but no, it was much more of a business than a creative venture. So I don't think I would have lasted too long uh, in any event. But yeah, so I had a job, so I wasn't really worried about that. Um, it was really, it was just really sad. And of course, we thought, because why wouldn't we, that it was over forever and ever. <laughs> right. Who could have thunk? <laughs> well, right. right. And we had no reason to think, no reason. So that was it. And, um, well, after the talk show ceased to exist, it freed you up to do some amazing work on many other shows, including Party Down, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. If you haven't seen it, find a way. <laughs> it's ridiculous and absurd, and also Children's Hospital. I mean, you went on to do a lot of weird shit after Will & Grace. I know. You really did. Like, I'm revisiting I'm all this. I'm the only weird one in the, <laughs> involved in, you know, I'm the, I'm the only weird one in the, on that Will & Grace show. <laughs> I am. I'm the weird one. And, um, yeah, so I did, you know, seven seasons of uh, Children's Hospital and and then I did um, Parks and Rec, Tammy, Tammy played too. some guy's ex-wife. My yeah. husband. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, yeah, a lot of really un kind of indie, undergroundy kind of things, which is where what I really like that. I mean, I think Karen is very, um, she's super weird. So She's very weird. Yeah. But not necessarily in an indie way. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> now, you guys, you, you um, got together last fall to do a campaign sketch for Will and Grace. So you reunited for that. Now, was there any sense of the reboot being imminent at that point, or did that grow out of that sketch being... Because I remember when it started to circulate, and it was as if, like, you know, the clouds had parted, and we're like, oh, my God, they're back. And, and you all looked exactly the same, and we're like, nothing's changed. Everything's still, like, the way it was. It felt... It, I'm, I still haven't gotten over that excitement. Um, I haven't either. <laughs> was, was NBC super excited the day that that premiered and thinking like, wow, this could actually work. This, everyone's looks great. No one looks well, like they've, you know, you know, fallen off a cliff or anything. We can I bring mean, this back. I don't want to, you know, I want to take credit, <laughs> but. Please do. Please do. Um, <laughs> first of all, in around, I guess it was around 2004. It was a couple seasons before we wrapped the first go around of Will and Grace. So around 2004, I had this idea because traditionally, if you are known as a sitcom character, like if you played Jethro on, you know, Beverly Hillbillies, you are then going to spend the entire rest of your career desperately trying to distance yourself from the character of Jethro on the Beverly Hillbillies. That's just sort of the math. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be hilarious to just keep doing it? And so. <laughs> So I had this idea to do a Broadway musical called Karen the Musical. <laughs> and, and it was all set. Like Fox Theatricals, who are a huge producing entity on Broadway, they do 
plays and musicals, and extremely successful Tony Award, multiple Tony Award winning producing production house. Uh, they were going to produce it, and a friend of mine was composing it. And the guy, this was pre um, Book of Mormon, so the guy who directed Book of Mormon was going to direct and choreograph here in the musical. And it was all in the works, and we were just trying to figure out like how we were going to write the book to the musical, who was going to write it. And I got a call from, NBC had signed off on it, and I got a call from Max and David, who are really beautiful, great friends of mine, lovely. And they had decided that they didn't want it to go forward for whatever reason. So that was the end of Karen the Musical. Um, Somebody else couldn't write it for you? Well, you can't use the character of Karen because they own the character of Karen. If you, uh, any characters from the pilot, they own. So I could have called it Marin the Musical. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, ugh, oh, too much trouble. Did you so, have any sense of what that story would have been? For oh, yeah. No, it was like pretty what, much. What, I mean, we'd already scene? written a couple of songs. <laughs> the, basically, the story, it was, invo- it was me and Beverly Leslie. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the basic... The basic premise was that Karen really, uh, that Karen goes to, goes to uh, Don't Tell Mamas to see Beverly Leslie do a one-man show. <laughs> and she becomes consumed with jealousy uh, and decides that she's going to show him that he's not the only one who can, you know, kill it in New York. Um, and so she owns like 27 Broadway theaters. She just realizes like she, she's like, oh, well, I could use one of the dust off one of these Broadway theaters I own. And so she decides to do a show called Karen the Musical, even though she's not an actress or anything. And um, so she's, she's going to, um, she's going to had, who's going to direct it? So she has some people in. She interviews some people to direct it. And one of them is named Leslie Beverly. And of course, it's Beverly Leslie in drag, but she doesn't realize it. So she hires Leslie Beverly to direct it. And so he spends the entire show like trying to sabotage her. And he, he actually like tries to kill her. And you think maybe he succeeded at one point. And so you were going to see, like, maybe the second act. You were gonna, it was going to be backstage for the first act. And then it was gonna, you're actually going to see what's going on in the second act of the actual Karen the Musical, like the show within the show. And, um, you know, like her, like, falling into the orchestra pit or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, I thought it was a really funny idea. <laughs> Don't you think we should do it? Yes. Oh, my God. I think they might change their minds now. Um, I think, I think they may change their minds. But now it's almost sort of beside the point because the whole show's come back. Like the idea at the time was that it was so avant-garde because the, it was, the show was over forever and you would never see the character of Karen again. But now like, okay, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so when you put on Karen clothes again for the first time and did the hair and you were in her skin, how did it feel? Oh, wait, I left out one good part of the story. Okay. So... <laughs> Please, please so aside share. from that, so we in um, in October we got the you know we had all agreed to do this election video and we got the script. Um, Max emailed the script to the four of us, and I read the script, and I was laughing out loud and I felt kind of emotional reading it, and I put it down and I picked up my phone and I emailed Max and I said why can't we do the show again? And he emailed back right away, we can. And he didn't know, and I didn't know. We were just pulling it out of our hoo-hahs. But um, I just knew when I read the script, I was like, well, there's no reason we can't just do the actual show again on television the same as before. There's no reason. Wow. I'm so glad that you sent him that email. (laughs) That's amazing. So within what period of time from when the election video started to circulate did did this actually materialize? Like fairly quickly. After oh that? yeah, it was. There was like a two or three day um, period. the 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 video was released. It was getting millions of views, and then uh, Bob Greenblatt waited like two or three days, and then he got in touch with um, Max or s- somebody, and was like, "Oh, hey, so this video, it's uh, it's really pretty pretty good. I don't suppose <laughs> you guys would uh, think about maybe doing the show again or." 
something like that. So I, know, I think it went in some way like that. That <laughs> Get he, the band back together. He also thought that it was a good idea to maybe try doing the show again. But, I mean, we never would have thought that it would happen. And Because um, everyone all, is really busy. I mean, at this point, all of you yeah. are very engaged in other jobs and yes. all over the place. Yeah, and, and we're... <laughs> And it just doesn't, it's, it's unprecedented. It's never happened. And especially then for, well, for the show to, you know, it's been fairly successful, which is another thing. Like, it's one thing to try it, and it's another thing to have it actually work. Um, but, yeah, so I think we, every minute that we're there on the set, we're very appreciative, and, and there's a lot of gratitude. And it's all the same. I'd say that's about 70% all of the same people from the first time around. So like wow. a lot of the same cameramen, same wardrobe, uh, same costume designers, same set designers, same set decorators, same, you know, so many people My are the Chris same. Chris is the unit photographer. He just feels like he never Oh, left. Chris Haston. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's unbelievable. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So that first day when Jimmy Burroughs was getting emotional, did you feel the same level of um, nostalgia, but also gratitude, and in, in, in how did it affect your performance? Because I imagine it's hard to go from that to Karen because she isn't those things. Right. <laughs> we were freaking. I mean, <laughs> you know, the audience, the audience was just on fire. And I mean, those laughs that you hear even, that was like the fourth episode we shot. They just air them out of order. And, you know, those laughs you hear are not fake. Those are the, that's just the studio audience. And um, we were like bouncing off the walls because there was so much. I mean, just think about how it's so weird. It feels like you. We feels like we never left at the same time that it feels like an actual miracle has occurred simultaneously. Those two things. And so when we shot that first episode, we we, we got done with the first pass of the first scene, and I just said, I said to the audience, "What I don't talk. I don't actually. I'm too shy to like." speak up to the audience unless it's one of my lines but um I said um we're doing well in grace again you guys because <laughs> it was just so crazy definitely yeah. a pinch me moment yeah and do you have a favorite Karenism from either from the most recent episodes or from the previous iteration that sticks with you where you feel like it's the consummate Karenism where if you say it you feel like her instantly Oh, gosh. I don't know. I mean, it's more behaviors than actual, I mean, honey, of course. But, you know, I think a lot of the behaviors, like the laughing and just, I don't, I don't have one thing in particular, though, no. Do you have a favorite scene that you've filmed this year so far? Well, uh, it's atypical, but yeah, that, that scene in the, in the, the episode we just watched that last scene yeah because I you know uh, not not I think it's it's only probably really has a great payoff if you've seen the other eight seasons you know if you've only right. seen this go around you'd be like hmm all right but for me <laughs> well, we have to know the Rosario Karen relationship to yes, really appreciate this. yeah right. and all of the history and um and and how Karen is and how she's tough and but, but for me, just personally, uh, you know, strangely enough, I just turned 59, and no one has ever, ever uh, written anything like that for me as an actor. I've never had a chance to, the, an, an opportunity to, um, to try, try myself out in that kind of storytelling that's oh. on the more dramatic side. So oh. well it done. meant a lot to me. You did it beautifully. Thank you. So we have some great audience questions I want to make sure we get to. Um, the first one is from Blake. Where is Blake? Somewhere? Oh, there he is. Hello. Um, and this is a great question. I was thinking the same thing. Um, Blake says, social media brings a new aspect to the creative and rehearsal process, and he loves how the cast is using social media while you're making the new version of the show. How, have you enjoyed this, and how are you integrating it into filming? You and Sean do a lot of great, like, BTS videos and such. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun. I, um, I like Instagram because I like pictures. <laughs> and um, it's interesting how they, like, at the, even in the Vote Honey video, they open with Will and Grace um, reading the paper on their iPads, which was a great way to kind of bring it into 2017. Um, 
but they've done a good job with that in the writing and then in real life I think that was the first time I realized that uh, there would be such a warm reception for the show to come back I had no idea like I started on social media kind of late and I started on Twitter about three years ago or so and um, and I never posted anything about Will and Grace because I thought, well, that would be really pathetic. That was a long time ago. That Except would be maybe so like Flashback really Friday. Really sad, yeah. <laughs> so I never did. And then Deborah Messing started tweeting at me and like something happened and we tweeted some photograph of us crying right after the very last take of, the la of what we thought was the very last scene of the very last episode <laughs> wow. back in 2006. And it got like 8 billion likes. And I was wow. like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> That's your test audience right there. And then, I mean, and then when the, the the video came out, we teased it. They, um, Max, the producers, uh, the creators, Max and David, hired this great woman uh, to to do the PR for the rollout of the um, video, and so we were teasing it, and people were going crazy on social media, and I thought, huh. <laughs> wow okay they used to have to do focus groups to get that kind of feedback and, and another thing that's surprising me now is a lot of people that are following me on social media are quite young and I I was hoping that that might happen but I, I wasn't really sure because I thought eh, might just be like the people from before you know <laughs> Has the demo shifted at all? Because I know at the time it was the top rated show among 18 to 34. Yeah, it's still, d it's doing really well wow. in that demographic. It's like advertising crack right there, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all they're looking for is yeah. that young demo. That's nuts. Uh, next question is from Terry. Where's Terry? Hello, Terry. Hi. Terry would like to know, um, how did you approach revisiting Karen? What did you change, if anything? And what were the biggest challenges in revisiting this character? The really, really tight dresses that they put me in are probably the biggest challenge. Yeah, and the heels. That would be the biggest or challenge because I can't eat wise. anything. I'm wearing like a scuba diving outfit in every <laughs> episode. I can't have like a cracker. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, Do you feel more pressure now about that stuff than you did at the time? No, I think that um, I'm quite a bit thinner than I was when we shot like the last episode in 2006. And so the, the costume designer has just like seized on me as the one to wear all the tight clothes. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't hold my stomach in for that long. <laughs> well, you know what? Spanx didn't exist when the show was on the first time. So Yeah, they did. They did? Oh, girl, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know about that. I wouldn't so. have made, made it through. They weren't, yeah, the, it wasn't weren't common Spain. knowledge. Okay. No, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, hadn't made it into quotidian life. Um, <laughs> you guys have a lot of secrets. We're, we're not privy to everything. No, I wouldn't have made it through all of those episodes without Spanx. <laughs> God bless um, Spanx. Yeah, so what was, oh, but getting back into it was strangely easy. Um, I, I always had this feeling that, <laughs> this is, sounds like, so Shirley McLeany, but um, I always had this sense that Karen was like just carrying on in her own reality in some parallel universe. Like I always felt that way completely. And it didn't, I mean, that was just right there. You should have seen, I mean, I wish you guys could have been there. It was so crazy. We did that secret, top secret video and um, we came in the first day and we sat down at the table and we read through this little script and it was just like no time had gone by at all and nobody every the characters all four characters were completely there and the chemistry was all completely intact I mean it was really I don't know it's crazy a very powerful moment um, next is from Hunter where's Hunter oh there he is hello in the middle um, in the new season of Will and Grace what was it like to film the shower scene with Deborah Messing <laughs> That was well, quite a feat. We've taken a lot of showers <laughs> together before. <laughs> so it was, we'd had a lot of uh, good uh, sense memory to work <laughs> with. Um, it was really fun. You know, the thing about that shower thing was that we, we never rehearsed it before we shot it because it was a, it was a, 
a stunt. And so it was a separate shower. Or, you know, it was obviously, you know, in the first scene, there's a shower with a door that opens. Well, this was obviously not. It was all one piece of glass made to look like a door that would open. And there was a whole, um, you had to climb up a ladder to a, a, a platform and then go over the edge of the shower down another ladder into the into the shower and um they started it with the water kind of lower and then because we had a few things before the water gets really high and it was all like heated up and nice and then when the water gets really high we were like oh snap you can do anything when you're in the water <laughs> and I didn't even know, I'm the only one apparently who didn't know, I didn't know until after we shot it that there was a Lucy and Ethel, uh, um, I Love Lucy, where Lucy and Ethel are in a shower together. Did you guys know that? I didn't know either. And um, I'm glad I didn't know though, because then I would have felt like, felt weird. So we got in there and all that stuff was just in the moment, you know, just and there was a lot of stuff that even just got, they couldn't, you know, they had to be cut for time or whatever, where it was crazy, you know, gymnastics in the water. But it was really fun to do. And then that thing where I dunk her at the very end, that was the last minute. Um, that was on the floor in the moment. And um, Jimmy said, dunk her. And I said, can I say, it's better this way? And they were like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was all just like one take. <laughs> And are you able to improv at all? Or well, that's very rare. It's right. very rare for something like that to happen so because we don't like really that. generally need to improvise. The only time we improvise is if there's a very long rolling laugh that we have to fill. So, but it's usually just little little things, but we're not improvising monologues. But that's a difference too because all the shows that I did between the two Will and Graces, people really were dying for you to improvise and it was almost expected and and um that you would improvise preferred hmm. yeah like a lot of improvisation so but there's no audience and you can kind of run as long as you want well i think and also because um the the scripts the shows were different like you can't this is more like a musical comedy without the music it's not the kind of thing that you can be like loose and just throw something in because it's very um you know, it's like a little symphony. It has to be like the timing and the pace of it has to be a certain way. And how often are the writers, um, I guess, adjusting jokes in the moment, maybe the jokes that don't land the way they hoped? Is, has that happened a lot? Because it certainly seems like these scripts are perfect when they come out. But, you know, when you do have the live audience, you do have the option to rework and then reshoot. Yeah, a lot of the jokes are floor pitches. So we had shot one one pass of the scene in the hospital in this episode and um, after the nurse tells me that Rosie's gone and, and then they gave me that, um, they gave me that joke, that was a floor pitch, where, where, what is she, there's there an underground maids fight club that I don't know about, that was a floor pitch, that wasn't in the script, so they do pitch jokes, um, some of them stay in, some of them don't, but yeah, it's great to have that option. Very much. The next question is from Jeff. Uh, this is not Will and Grace related, but he wants to know, do you still get starstruck when you work with someone new or someone you admire? I, uh, I don't, I, like I met Miranda July recently and I was flipping my lid. <laughs> <laughs> like I was totally freaking out. She's very cool. But the, yeah, there's a small category of people that I would freak out over. Um, but yeah, I've met Meryl Streep a couple times and I can't function very well. <laughs> but no, there aren't that many. I, I'm pretty good about, you know, because I feel like we're all in this same business and it's really like a service industry, more or less. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're just supposed very valuable to be, service. you know, um, provide, you know we're providing an entertainment of whatever nature to an audience and uh, it successfully, hopefully. Um, so that's how I feel about it. So I guess when I meet other actors, I'm like, hey, buddy, <laughs> did, you, did you clock in? <laughs> You're like factory workers. <laughs> yeah. And when you aren't working, uh, what do you enjoy watching? What, what really cracks porn. you up? <laughs> Straight porn. Well, you told us how you like to spend your downtime at home, so it all makes sense. <laughs> no, uh... We, uh, my, my husband and I watch... Um, Who's your husband? I'm sorry. Oh, his name is Nick Offerman. He Heard played of him. Ron Heard Swanson of him. on Parks and Recreation. 
Uh, he may or may not be here right now. <laughs> I'm not sure. He's carving something in the back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but uh, we watch all the good stuff just like you guys watch. <laughs> probably the same. Are you Netflix people or are you, do you like to discover kind of fringy weird well, stuff? Well, like, we, we watched... Um, Oh gosh, I'm just blanking. Um, we watched the best movie the night. Really oh, we watched a Mike Lee movie night before last called Another Year. Oh, oh yeah, that's, a, that's such a, great a good one. one. If not you guys really funny seen per se, that. but no, you know, sweet. not hilarious. But then I you know watch all the good shows that everybody else watches. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot except of um we don't watch uh what's the one that are that's the most popular major things no the one with the dragons and the <laughs> yeah we haven't gotten into that one yet but we, we might do that all at in one fell swoop at some point <laughs> when you have a good chunk of time yeah um and i'm curious will we ever meet stan no, he will okay. never appear on camera. You you might see a dental X-ray or a f- <laughs> finger or you know a footprint, but never <laughs> the man himself, a shadow. In the original um, Rosario's Quinceanera, they had set up a a tent for him. Uh, he doesn't <laughs> he didn't like people that. to see him cry, yeah. and so there was a tent. And there was a giant shadow, like <laughs> a ginormous <laughs> shadow behind it. Because, you know, he weighs like 700 pounds yes. or something. And um, they had to cut it because it just wasn't working technically. And it was the episode was long anyway. So, yes. And how long do you anticipate this new run going? I know 20 years. 20 years. <laughs> And that's 20 still, to 25. Still not long enough, I have to say. Um, I'm well, saying 20 to be coy for the network, <laughs> but 20 to 25. Well, I am sure I can I'm speak. I'm the only one. You know, everybody's so really business savvy. Like, everybody in the cast is like, oh, I don't know if I could possibly do another episode. And I'm like, I'll do it until I drop dead. So, <laughs> sorry, there's my big bargaining chip out the window. I don't care. In it's a meantime. great job. Like, what, you know, you got to be crazy to be like, mm, I don't know. Let me think. Because people are like that. They are. You know, yeah. Well, yeah. also, some people live in New York. They don't live here. So it's a little bit more of a. Oh, a yeah, hassle. sure. But yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's. <laughs> it's not. You know, Deborah, uh, Deborah li- does live in New York. So that's a real logistical. She has a, she's a single mom and 13 year old son. And so that's like a huge thing. Um, but I, th- I think everybody wants to do it again. It's just that other people are better at playing that game than I am. <laughs> I just don't play it. I'm just like, I don't care. <laughs> I'll just, yeah, let's just do it. Well, I think I speak for everyone. I say we're so grateful that you're back. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You Thank so you guys. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. It. Really appreciate it. <laughs>